Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 29. Impeachment. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last week, we heard all about Charles I's first parliament. The king expected the assembly to grant him his taxation, in order to fight the war which parliament had supported the year before. He expected a minimum of three subsidies, which had been widely assumed to be approved before the 1624 parliament had been prorogued. He expected no serious opposition so early in his reign. On each point, Charles's expectations would be disappointed. Not only did Charles only receive two subsidies, his traditional right to collect tonnage and poundage, a valuable trade duty granted to the monarch for life, was restricted to a single year. Both Houses of Parliament were sceptical of the government's war plans, partly for general strategic concerns, but partly because of who would be leading them. The Duke of Buckingham, George Villiers. Buckingham was the Lord High Admiral, the commander of all of the King's naval might, and he had no combat experience and had been notoriously seasick. So, not a sterling CV for the position. Worse, Buckingham was widely hated in both Houses of Parliament, and in the wider country, for his corruption and his incompetence. So, when Charles dissolved his useless parliament in the summer of 1625 in the middle of a plague, he was left with not enough money for the war he had already prepared for. But with the soldiers already mustered, and the ships already requisitioned, the undersupplied, undertrained, flotilla of future failure set off from Plymouth at the command of the Viscount Wimbledon. And as we also heard last week, the expedition was a disaster of poor planning, poor decision-making, poor discipline, and left thousands of Anglo-Dutch dead on the shores and in the waters of Cadiz. That the seizure of Cadiz had been the lowest priority of the expedition was irrelevant to the Duke's enemies. It was a stark example of complete failure. As this was a naval expedition, it was at the feet of the Lord Admiral where the book stopped, and the already unpopular Buckingham had a national embarrassment added to his rap sheet. Oh, and English ships had been used by the French to attack Protestants. That also hardly helped his reputation either, especially since Buckingham was not only responsible for the English vessels as High Admiral, but he had been instrumental in arranging the French marriage and the associated agreements. He had won his king a bride, but she had come with promises of French aid against the Spanish. Instead, in an act Kishlansky describes simply as a betrayal, Cardinal Richelieu not only used English assets to crush internal dissent, but signed a separate, secret truce with Spain. Charles had gambled on the Cardi's expedition. He had not received the funding nor the political support he had expected from the useless parliament, and so rolled the dice on a successful military adventure to bring much-needed support from his subjects. A mildly successful foray into the European war to satisfy his Dutch and Danish allies and to start the ball rolling on a larger military commitment was all the king needed. No grand, glorious victory, no changing of the course of the war, just a brief, successful action. An unmitigated disaster was the very last thing he needed, which was exactly why Wimbledon's orders had been so cautious. But an unmitigated disaster is exactly what the Viscount brought him, as his scattered fleet limped back to port. That Charles now had to call another parliament was not a surprise, it had been the plan. But now, and not for the last time, he did so in the very worst position possible. 
Charles did his best to reduce the criticism he knew his closest minister would face. Six of the most vocal opponents of Buckingham in the 1625 Commons were appointed as sheriffs in their constituencies, and so made ineligible to become an MP. These men are both old names in Pax Britannica, as well as future recurring characters. Sir Edward Coke, Sir Francis Seymour, Sir Robert Phillips, Sir Guy Palms, Sir Thomas Wentworth and Edward Alford. All six were made sheriffs, and so their voices were temporarily silenced. Coke was, of course, a former Attorney General, a former Chief Justice of the Common Pleas, and a former Chief Justice of the King's Bench. He had repeatedly opposed James I in legal matters, and had been steadily demoted until he was evicted from his judicial positions in 1616. The prestige of Coke was such that, even today, four centuries later, he is quoted as an authority on English and now British constitutional law. After losing his last judicial position, Coke would stand in Parliament, and he will continue to be a major thorn in James and Charles's side. In addition to removing troublesome members of the Commons, Charles began stacking the House of Lords with new peers, picking either those who would be favourable towards his government, or noted critics from the Commons, who would now be promoted to a more pliant body. But, as vocal as those six men had been in 1625, their removal from the 1626 Parliament was, hmm, less than effective in silencing criticism. Likewise, filling the upper house with stooges hardly reduced dislike among the lords for Buckingham. One of their criticisms, after all, had been his expansion of the peerage, while those critics who had been uplifted continued to speak against the government, but from much nicer benches. Both of these actions only increased the anxiety among parliamentarians that their institution would become little more than a formality, as had occurred to numerous continental assemblies. The lone critics of 1625 were bolstered by dozens, if not hundreds, of critical voices entering Parliament in February 1626. The month prior, Charles had had his coronation, although his wife, Henrietta Maria, had refused to be crowned by a Protestant, and went so far as absenting herself from the ceremony entirely. This was just one of the catalogue of slights and disputes the royal couple were, now, only months into their marriage, firing at one another, but more on that in a future episode. In Parliament, Sir John Eliot was one of those voices speaking against the Duke. He had witnessed the return of some of the Cardi's ships, and when he spoke in Parliament, he did not mince his words. Our honour is ruined. Our ships are sunk. Our men perished, not by the sword, not by an enemy, not by chance, but by those we trust. Buckingham now faced a range of accusations of incompetence, corruption, and disloyalty. Some of these were part and parcel of being a powerful figure in the government. Parliament was full of people who had been overruled, replaced, or otherwise disappointed by the Duke, or the clients of those people, and now they jumped at the chance to bring him down. Some were due to factors we've discussed previously. Disgust for the incredible graft the Villiers clan was conducting while the Duke sat at the monarch's right hand, while others resented the expansion of the peerage. Since the death of James, a smear had been gleefully spread that the Duke had actually poisoned him, although for what reason he would do this depended on the one making the accusation. Since Charles took power, Buckingham was also blamed for the failure to adequately supply and reinforce the English expedition dispatched under James to the continent. If you recall, this was the small force which had been hamstrung for political reasons and prevented from aiding the Dutch in the siege of Breda. On top of the military failures was a thick layer of diplomatic fiascos. The French agreements, championed by Buckingham, were not worth the paper they were written on, 
especially once the news of the leaked Franco-Spanish peace reached London. He was also a convenient villain to be blamed for the king's autocratic tendencies. The fears that Parliament would be ignored and transformed into a powerless body found personification in the Duke, since it was known that he had advised Charles to find alternative ways of governing that ignored Parliament. All of this was aimed squarely at the Duke of Buckingham. As Kuschlansky puts it, the grievance of all grievances was the Duke. His unpopularity was not a secret, and Charles had warned Parliament not to attack his favourite. In collaboration with allies in the Lords, mainly the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Abbott, and with Buckingham's enemies at court, mainly the Queen, Henrietta Maria, the Commons did it anyway, and prepared to impeach the Duke of Buckingham. On the 8th of May, Sir Dudley Diggs gave a speech to the House of Lords. I'll read the preamble in full, and while it's lengthy and a little bit circular, it does a great job of showing exactly where George Villiers stands. Quote, For the speedy redress of great evils and mischiefs, and of the chief cause of these evils and mischiefs which this Kingdom of England now grievously suffereth, and of late years hath suffered, and to the honour and safety of our Sovereign Lord the King, and of his crown and dignity, and to the good and welfare of his people, the Commons in this present Parliament, by the authority of our said Sovereign Lord the King assembled, do, by this their bill, show and declare against George, Duke, Marquis and Earl of Buckingham, Earl of Coventry, Viscount Villiers, Baron of Wadden, Great Admiral of the Kingdoms of England and Ireland, and of the Principality of Wales, and of the Dominions and Islands of the same, of the Town of Calais, and of the Marches of the same, and of Normandy, Gascony, and Guienne, General Governor of the Seas and Ships of the said Kingdom, Lieutenant General Admiral, Captain General, and Governor of His Majesty's Royal Fleet and Army lately set forth, Master of the Horse of our Sovereign Lord the King, Lord Warden, Chancellor and Admiral of the Sink Ports, and of the members thereof, Constable of Dover Castle, Justice in Heir of the Forests and Chases on this side the River Trent, Constable of the Castle of Windsor, Gentleman of His Majesty's Bedchamber, one of His Majesty's most honourable Privy Council in his realms both in England, Scotland and Ireland, and Knight of the Most Honourable Order of the Garter. The misdemeanours, misprisons, offences, crimes, and other matters comprised in the articles following, and him, the said Duke, do accuse and impeach of the said misdemeanours, misprisons, offences, and crimes. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and it's bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to babbel.com and use promo code RECORDEDHISTORY. That's B A. B-B-E-L dot com, code recorded history, Babel language for life. That was quite the list of titles, but 
That is to be expected from the second most powerful man in the kingdom. Sir Dudley continues with a celestial metaphor which describes Buckingham as a comet, which is weird, and I won't read it here. What follows that is a lengthy description of all of the crimes which Buckingham's enemies were accusing him of, and which, in their view, required his immediate impeachment. These mostly follow the grievances we just covered. Corruption, siphoning the realm's revenues to his family, selling titles and offices, accusations of poisoning James, and general incompetence. All those titles I just read out? Well, the articles of impeachment make the very sensible case that those positions should be spread out among several proven servants, since no man, no matter how competent, could manage them all effectively. Not that the Duke was competent, oh no no, the articles go on to explain in detail how Buckingham had failed in his multiple roles. As Lord High Admiral, he had left the seas unguarded, the fleet in disrepair, and several of them had been handed over to help crush a Protestant revolt. Further, they argue that the Duke knew what they would be used for. The article even recalled the Duke's dealings with the East India Company. If you remember back in episode 20, we discussed how the East India Company had technically violated their charter when they allied with the Safavids against the Portuguese. On their return, they paid some gifts to the Duke and the King of around £10,000 each. Whether this was a gift, or a bribe, or a fine depended on who you were talking to, and Parliament saw it as a fine, an illegal one at that. In fact, a substantial portion of the Articles of Impeachment are devoted to the affair, so much so I was suspicious, and I looked into it. Lo and behold, Sir Dudley, who had given the floor to Sir John Glanville at this point, had been one of the investors in that trip, and so his reward was cut into by the Duke and the King, and he was by no means the only MP to have lost money in that affair. Further, in Dr Sean Kelsey's biography of Glanville, he suggests that the lawyer had previously tried to attach himself to the rising star of the Duke, and had been rejected. This is just an example of how personal this attack on Buckingham was. The entire process of presenting the articles took two days, such was their detail. Sir John Eliot concluded the articles with his own speech, quote, Your lordships have an idea of the man, what he is in himself, what in his affections. You have seen his power, and some, I fear, have felt it. You have known his practice, and have heard the effects. It rests then to be considered, what, being such, He is, in reference to the king and state, how compatible or incompatible with either. Eliot went on to compare the duke to Sejanus, a Roman prefect who was the right-hand man of the emperor Tiberius, and who had concentrated a vast amount of power in his own hands. The implication, aware to all the educated men in that chamber, was that this meant Charles was Tiberius, not a flattering comparison. With the articles of impeachment presented, royal wrath was swift to fall on those who had defied Charles's will to leave the Duke alone. Both Eliot and Diggs were arrested and imprisoned in the Tower of London. Buckingham sent a note to the King, denying the accusations and describing his critics as, quote, First, meddling and busy persons who love popular speeches, secondly, covetous landlords, enclosers, depopulators, who, being of the Parliament, ease themselves in subsidies and lay it on the true commons, and cry out the grievances are caused by the Duke. Thirdly, recusants, who hate the Duke for the breach of the Spanish match. Fourthly, persons indebted, who by privilege of Parliament avoid payment. Fifthly, Puritans and sectaries, though two of them scarcely agree in what they would have, haters of government and would have the king's power extinguished in matters ecclesiastical and limited in civil. Sixthly, 
male contents, who look upon the duke with an evil eye because themselves are not preferred. Seventhly, lawyers, who are very sit in Parliament to second any complaint against both church and king and all his servants, with their customs, antiquities, records, statutes, presidents and stories. Eighthly, merchants and citizens, who deceive the king of custom. Ninthly, innovators, plebicola. So, in the duke's eyes, and at least in his words, his critics are either hypocrites, religious or political enemies of the king, or populists. If Charles had been on the fence about sacrificing his friend, as his father had done with Bacon and Middlesex, this clearly convinced him. He entered the House of Lords and, as he was no fan of wordplay, gave his own very short speech. My lords, the cause, and only cause of my coming to you today, is to express the sense I have of all your honours, for he that toucheth any of you toucheth me in a very great measure. I have thought fit to take order for the punishing some insolent speeches lately spoken. I have been too remiss heretofore in punishing such speeches as concern myself. Not that I was greedy of their monies, but that Buckingham, through his importunity, would not suffer me to take notice of them, lest he might be thought to have set me on, and that he might come the forwarder to his trial. And to approve his innocency as touching the matters against him, I myself can be a witness to clear him in every one of them. After the king left, Buckingham made his own appearance and gave a humble speech where he defended his actions and criticised the commons for telling the lords how they should act, especially since he had not had a chance to speak in his own defence. The lords was, after all, a court of law, and impeachment was a legal process. Yet the motivation behind this impeachment was political. There was little to no evidence for most of the accusations made, and Buckingham's enemies were outspoken in their dislike of his position. Back in the Commons, they were furious at the arrest of their colleagues, and announced they would not conduct any more business until they were freed. Diggs was released first. He had been arrested for impugning the King's honour with a specific phrase in response to Sir John's accusation that the Duke poisoned James. That he did forbear to speak further of that in regard of the king's honour. In other words, he implied that Charles knew the Duke of Buckingham had poisoned his father. This was quite clearly treasonous, but Diggs denied saying it, and many of the lords and record keepers denied hearing it, arguing that if they had, they would have immediately reprimanded him. After his release, Diggs had met with the king and kissed his hands but while the formalities were of forgiveness, Charles did not, and he would remember. Elliot would follow him out of the tower a few days later, and Parliament criticised him for the tone of his speech. It was too tart, they said, and he had been unfair in his language against the Duke. He had only referred to the Duke dismissively as that man or this man, which was just rude. He had feigned ignorance over events which the House knew to be true, mainly that the loaned ships had been returned by France, and that his comparisons of the Duke to Sejanus and the disgraced Bishop of Ely had been besides the point. Eliot defended himself on some points and accepted the criticism on others. The Lords were no more settled. They were in the midst of protecting their own rights and privileges, as they too appeared to be under threat from the king. They sent petition after petition to Charles protesting the imprisonment of Thomas Howard, the 21st Earl of Arundel. Arundel had been imprisoned after marrying his son, Henry, the future 22nd Earl of Arundel, to Lady Elizabeth Stuart, without the king's permission. Yes, that surname is correct, she was the granddaughter of one of James's first favourites, Esme Stuart, and part of the extended Stuart dynasty. Kings tend to be very cautious when it comes to potential claimants, especially after they marry into powerful noble families. 
Arundel would be released in June 1626, but he would not remain at liberty for long. Aside from championing him in Parliament, Charles displayed his favour publicly by granting the Duke another honour, the Chancellorship of Cambridge University. It was meant to be an election, but the King's will was made obvious to all, and Buckingham was duly mm, elected. The Commons added this to a growing list of abuses, and Charles countered that as the university derived its existence from him, he could have a hand in how it was ran. On the 8th of June, Buckingham spoke to the House of Lords and defended himself against the charges listed in the Articles of Impeachment. He had gained his titles and honours not through ambition or avarice, but because the king, in his majesty, had decided to grant them to him. If the king decided he wasn't up to the task, then he would return them to the king. The Lord High Admiralship had, similarly, been granted to him despite refusing the honour, but both King James and the Earl of Nottingham had just insisted that he have the office, Yes, he'd paid the Earl of Nottingham £3,000, but that was out of respect, not a condition of the office. It was a gift, not a payment. Buying the wardenship of the sink ports was not done out of ambition, but because, as Lord High Admiral, it made sense for him to be responsible for them. They didn't bring in much money, only a measly £500 a year. Their previous holder wouldn't relinquish them, though, without payment so what could he do? And on it went, prepared reasons for the mistakes, errors and crimes of which he was accused. He gave his own account of the East India Company affair, and of loaning ships to the French, and what he had been told they would be used for. Nevertheless, Parliament kept up the pressure on the Duke, and the King refused to abandon his closest minister and friend, Even with this Parliament in the process of granting him three new subsidies, their value was not worth the loss of Buckingham. He was still in terrible financial straits, but with the Commons gunning for Buckingham, and the Lords not doing their duty and filibustering the impeachment, or simply throwing it out, what else could he do? So, on the 15th of June, 1626, with nothing to show for it, Charles dissolved his second parliament. While this parliament achieved very few positives for Charles, it had a multitude of negative consequences. There was even greater distrust and resentment in both houses, for one, but for another, it made it incredibly difficult to divide the unpopular Duke of Buckingham from the king. We've spoken of this before, but this is only the first time that Charles' unwillingness to distance himself from politically dangerous ministers will come back to bite him. The staple defence of monarchy, the idea that evil councillors were responsible for unpopular policies, had stood kings in good stead for centuries. The monarch's reputation remained unblemished, as their servants took the blame like good scapegoats. James had understood this. Charles either did not, or wasn't ruthless enough. The more the king stubbornly clings to Buckingham, the more the duke's stain will rub off on him. So I wanted to call today's episode James and the Giant Impeach, because I'm terrible at puns, and I'm very proud to have thought of that one. But he'd been dead for a year at this point, so it would be a bit of a stretch. Maybe when I get to James II. Just a reminder, next week is Sound Education in Boston. There's a lot happening, so come along if you can. I had a very kind offer from the Boston by Foot tour group, which seemed very interesting, but sadly it doesn't look like I'll have the time. If you're in Boston and do have a few hours, keep them in mind. bostonbyfoot.org Also, as listeners of last week's Revolutions will know, as well as people who follow me on Twitter, I will be interviewing Mike Duncan, when we're both in Boston. We'll be talking all about the British Civil Wars, six years on from when he launched revolutions, as well as whatever else comes to mind. Considering that he, jointly with David Crowther, was my chief inspiration for starting a history podcast in the first place, 
I'm very excited. So that will go up on the feed in due course. Of course, I couldn't afford to attend sound education at all, or pay for the audio equipment that I'll be interviewing Mike Duncan with, if it wasn't for my wonderful and generous patrons. The Royal Headsman, executed today. Her Grace the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich. His Grace the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin. The Most Honourable Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer. The Right Honourable Countess of Shrewsbury, Elaine Dickens. The Countess of Surrey, Jean Buckley. The Earl of Oxford, Christopher Grogan. The Right Honourable Earl of Somerset, Brendan Bonner. The Countess of Cornwall, Belinda Clarence. The Earl of Hereford, Christopher Remo. The Earl of Dunbar, Angus Wilson. The Earl of Southampton, Alan Goldstein. The Earl of Northampton, Justin Drowns. Stephen, Earl of Warwick. The Earl of Bradford, Richard Little. The Earl of Northumberland, Michael Thomas. And the Earl of Ormond, Mark Lemke. Remember that you can join the peerage at patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. If you want to support me in another way, tell a friend about Pax Britannica, or leave a positive review on your favourite podcast app. Algorithms and SEO are all well and good, but it's word of mouth that really helps a podcast grow. Thanks again to Sounds Like an Earful for providing the music in today's episode, to every member of my House of Lords, and to you for listening. <laughs>